and welcome. You're tuned into The Current. My name is Erin Curran and I'm your host. The Current is a show all about sparking curiosity, embracing change, and shifting perspective. Today, I'm delighted to welcome on the show, Dud Hendrick. Thank you, Dud, for coming on. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity. Absolutely. And you'll notice my dog, D Decaf, wandering in and off uh, the, the screen there. So D, as usual, is also on the show today. Dud is a um, current member of Veterans for Peace and former uh, president of Maine Veterans for Peace. And so we're going to be talking about your involvement in that for sure. Um, and I just want to say welcome again. And um, yeah, I, I met Dud uh, at the Pachacacha or Pechacucha night in Portland. Um, and so I got to know a little bit about your, your history and what you're passionate about and was um, intrigued and wanted to know more about you and about the, um, the, the issues in the world that really speak to your heart and that you feel um, conviction around, enough, enough so to be arrested um, on a number of occasions and to travel quite far distances around the world. Um, so, All true. Yeah. Uh, I'll admit to everything you've accused me of being. <laughs> uh, one is that I'm certainly very passionate about Veterans for Peace and the issues that uh, Veterans for Peace addresses. And I, I'm not unique at all in the population of Veterans for Peace members. It's, uh, it usually constitutes uh, a, a pretty abrupt uh, change of direction in terms of, uh, of energy um, devotion. And it certainly has in my case. So. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about these issues. Yeah, well, let's start with that, because I, I know um, just by its name, if our viewers aren't familiar with the organization Veterans for Peace, you can make some um, uh, assumptions based on the name of the group that these are uh, former military personnel of some sort who have then had a change of heart and are now um, working towards peaceful solutions and resolutions to what maybe were military involvement. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about um, your history and how that change occurred for you? So Veterans for Peace was founded in Maine. I'm very proud of that. Um, it was founded in 1985 by four or five veterans of the Vietnam War uh, to include one of those who's still very much involved in our chapter. In fact, is the president of our chapter once again. He's the He's the now and uh, once again the president of our chapter, Doug Rawlings, who's from Farmington. Uh, Doug and these other individuals were sitting around a table at a Friendly's restaurant back in 1985, somewhere in Maine, I'm not quite sure where it was, and yeah. they realized that they had similar sentiments about their participation in the Vietnam War. And uh, those happened to be very anti-war fundamental uh, sens uh, sensibilities. Uh, within a few years, the uh, organization that they founded had nearly 5,000 members and now has about 7,000 members. We have chapters in every state in the country. We have a chapter in Okinawa, in Japan. We have a, a chapter in Korea, South Korea, of course. We have a chapter in Vietnam, a chapter in the British Isles. Uh, so it's very much an international organization now. Uh, Doug Rawlings is uh, Maine's state poet, I think, or has been, something oh, wow. like that. He certainly has been Veterans for Peace is poet, uh, the poet laureate. And he writes some great stuff, not all about the Vietnam era, but uh, he's been uh, a, uh, the soul of our chapter, I think, whether or not he's been the president all of these years. Mm. We have about 140 members in the chapter in our state. There actually are two chapters. There's one whose membership is primarily from the Bangor area. I happen to live on Deer Isle, uh, but when I became involved back in about 1992, I think, uh, it wasn't until then that I learned about Veterans for Peace. Yeah. Um, our, the chapter that I joined was the only chapter that existed. So when I go to chapter meetings, I'm traveling two or three hours south to find a, a meeting. But it's become such an important part of, of who I am that I, uh, for most of these years, have been happy to travel those miles to get with fellow brothers and sisters who share my sentiments. 
Yeah, well, thank you for giving us that overview of the organization. And I wonder now if you would be um, able to share a little bit more personally of, of where um, in your personal history you sort of had a, a, a change of heart or what your, what your involvement in the military was versus um, with Veterans for Peace, what that's looked like. Mm -hmm. uh, I grew up in the Annapolis area. Uh, about 10 miles out of Annapolis. I never really aspired to go to the Naval Academy, but it's where I ended up. I entered the Academy in 1959. I hesitate to admit how many years ago that was or disclose that. Uh, but at that point in time, um, to be quite forthright about, Vietnam was hardly a blip on the horizon. Yeah. Uh, there was some uh, U.S. military presence in Vietnam, but hardly any at all. And certainly, generally, in the American populace, there was no sensitivity about there being a war on the horizon in Vietnam. Um, be that as it may, I went to the academy without really evaluating or understanding what going into the military meant. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, frankly and honestly, was seduced by the fact that I was recruited as an athlete there and without thinking about the fact that I was essentially saying that I would go off to war if my commander in chief dictated that I ought to be going off to war, no matter where that might be or for whatever purpose that might yeah. be. Yeah. So I don't think I was any more or any less naive than my fellow uh, in that. In, in those days, there were only male cadets or midshipmen at all the service academies. Uh, when I graduated in 1963, the Vietnam War was uh, then really very much on the horizon. And within a couple of years, a lot of my classmates went off to, to Vietnam. In the winter of 1965-66, my very best friend, a former teammate, was killed in Vietnam. Mm. And uh, by that time, I had, uh, I had transferred into the Air Force when I graduated from the academy. I was one of the few who was permitted to do that and felt very fortunate in being allowed to do it. Mm. But I had gone into a facet of the Air Force called Explosive Ordnance Disposal, uh, bomb squad work, if you will. Okay. Um, so when my friend Donnie McLaughlin was killed in Vietnam, I, in my grief and despair and, uh, I suppose, seeking vengeance or something, I, uh, I volunteered. There were other contributing factors, none of which I see as constituting a reason to go off to some country about which I knew very little, mm -hmm. uh, about uh, either the people, their history, their culture, or whatever, to essentially participate in the taking of other lives yeah. in, their, in their country. Um, that wasn't a, a perspective that I had come to. That wasn't the level of enlightenment that I think any of us who went off to Vietnam gave much consideration to. I don't think I, again, was unique in not having the maturity or the, or the foresight to, to uh, engage or to, to represent. Um, so I spent a year in Vietnam. Uh, I can recall through that period of time, I very much was aware that it seemed to be a futile effort. Mm. It seemed to be, uh, I, I've, in retrospect and through that year, I saw instances of racism I saw that we treated both Vietnamese allies and Vietnamese enemy as lessers. Mm. Um, but I can't say that it disturbed my sensi sensibilities to the extent that it turned me against war altogether. I don't think I, again, had the maturity to have, to have that perspective. So I came back from Vietnam. I entered graduate school. I went on to a career as a coach at Dartmouth College and in, in athletics for the next uh, 15 years or so was busy finding family or making family, get engaged in my community. My wife and I ended up uh, coming to Deer Isle where we had a country inn for 20 years. And uh, through that period of time, I began to look at foreign policy mm. and our engagement as uh, um, we have been over those 40 years or so between the time I graduated from college and the end of the, de end of the century. And I was less and less proud of what we were doing. I was affected by the likes of Howard Zinn, the author of A People's History of mm -hmm. the United States, uh, Noam Chomsky, a great scholar, other left-leaning, if you will, authors. Mm -hmm. And then I found Veterans for Peace. And together with those authors uh, and many others, I uh, now see war as a futile and misdirected uh, uh, 
commitment of foreign policy and fundamental to Veterans for Peace is the belief that uh, we ought not to have war as part of foreign policy at all. Mm. So naive as that may sound, uh, I think it's naive to believe that war is going to bring, bring us peace. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I am fascinated by your personal history and really appreciate you going into some detail for not only um, me, but for all of our viewers who um, maybe weren't um, ever, uh, maybe haven't been born um, during the, the Vietnam War, didn't really know. Maybe, they, uh, maybe they've seen the Ken Burns documentary. Um, maybe their, their knowledge of that era is just from, from such films. And those are great um, you know, resources for, mm -hmm. for folks, but I think hearing from someone and your personal experience, um, and certainly I can relate to just thinking about my late teens and early 20s and, and even into my, you know, later 20s and just how, how naive and how foolish my decisions um, were looking back on that time and just how young we are when we're young and we, we do things impulsively. And so I think regardless of whether our viewers have been, um, involved in a war or if it's just in their own personal life, we can certainly relate to, um, you know, being impulsive or um, um, not thinking or having an ideal that maybe wasn't well sorted out or thought out and, and taking action around that. So I, I uh -huh. relate to your story, even though I'm not a veteran myself and have never been in the military. So I'm curious um, what what it looks like to be a member of Veterans for Peace. Um, what sort, in addition to attending meetings, you say that you get together and, and sharing these um, fundamental philosophies about peace, the role of peace, the, the, um, the futility of war. What, um, what sorts of action have you been involved in with Veterans for Peace? Um, I think that will, will constitute a... Uh, a step beyond where I'd like to go at the moment. I want to go back okay. to some issue that I yeah. neglected to, to, to speak to that really was the transformative experience that I had uh, that brought me to being a peace activist, if you will. Yeah. And that was in 1998. So several years after I had sort of unquestionably been sensitized in that direction, I began to make this what I consider to be a real transformation in life is uh, I was invited to participate in a... Uh, an event in Vietnam uh, brought together by an organization called World Team Sports. And TEAM, it's a nonprofit organization. TEAM, in their usage, stands for The Exceptional Athlete Matters. And exceptional refers to disabled athletes. Their purpose was to bring together disabled athletes and able-bodied athletes to participate in rather extraordinary events. Hmm. This, the Vietnam Challenge, the bike ride that we had in Vietnam in 1998, was the second major event that they sponsored. I was uh, blessed to be invited to be the operations director. So I was the head of the volunteer staff that hmm. directed the, uh, the operation or the ride in Vietnam. We bicycled over the course of three weeks from Hanoi, the present capital of, uh, of Vietnam, to uh, to Saigon, now Ho Chi Minh. Well, Ho Chi Minh City is now the, now the capital of the, of the entire country, a distance of about 1,200 miles. We had uh, about 30 or 40 athletes or bicycle participants who were veterans of America, of the United States, or our allies. And we had about that many, a few less, of, of more former mortal enemies. So individuals, men and women, who had been engaged in the war as mortal enemies. Wow. And so through the course of those three weeks we're together, there were virtually tears every night. I mean, we had amputees and uh, paraplegics and quadriplegics on hand cycles. We had blind individuals on the backs of tandem bikes. And, yeah. uh, you can imagine, it was just an unbelievably emotional experience. Wow. As, as I think about it and retell it, yeah. as I am now, I nearly am provoked to tears. Just yeah. So... The upshot of it all really was, I think I was not alone. I think that universally those of us who participated were brought to a, a rather enlightened notion of this idea that we are all brothers and sisters. Yeah. And we traveled in one another's shoes, basically, on those three weeks. We've remained friends. I go back, I've been back to Vietnam three times since that experience in 1998. I've been sensitized to the to the victimization of that war that those people and their land suffered uh, mm most particularly 
uh, Agent Orange. This allows me to begin to address the question that you, uh, yeah. that you wanted to take us. Um, so I became involved a little bit in the Agent Orange uh, campaign uh -huh. to try to seek uh, restitution for people who are victimized in Vietnam. There are over two million people who are institutionalized today in Vietnam, unable to take care of themselves because as second and third generations of that, of that uh, contamination of waters and lands, mm. they are unable to, to do that, to take care of themselves. So that type of experience, I think, sensitizes one to the other. Um, Absolutely, and then just to, to jump in on, on this ride that you were talking about and, and spending time with the other, with the mortal enemy, as mm -hmm. you described, like that's so powerful. It gives me chills hearing you talk about that. It's, it's, it's so simple to spend time with someone, and yet what a profound impact, because when we don't spend time with with the other, like you say, it's so easy to demonize and mm -hmm. and um, objectify, and yeah, and certainly. and not relate to that person. But as soon as we allow them in, or we open ourselves to being real with them and seeing that our needs are the same, our desires are the same, our hearts, are, you know, mm -hmm. we have the same feelings. All of that opens these floodgates of like, oh my gosh. Yeah. What 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 was I thinking? What what are we thinking in war? Well said. Yeah. yeah. I just it's it just gives me chills to think about what that must have been like. And you said tears. I can just imagine mm -hmm. um, every every opportunity to just get to know and sort of break down that barrier and just see and yeah. like feel. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for sharing it with me here. Yeah. I let me let me share with uh, our listeners just one anecdote from that ride. Yeah, please. We had a. Uh, uh, an American veteran who had lost a leg to a landmine on the ride by the name of Dan Jensen. Dan Jensen is an ultra marathoner. Uh, I don't know if he remains that today. He may well be, but uh, he was, this was in 1998 that we had the bike ride. Early on in the bike ride, he was riding along and with the aid of a, an interpreter, he was able to communicate to the single leg amputee Vietnam rider next to him. Yeah. Tron is his name. Tron and Dan, it turned out, lost their legs in the same battle. Wow. So uh, they, they learned that on one of our early mornings, and that day at lunch, they uh, challenged one another to a, a race down a, a path in the, <laughs> at our lunch break. And uh, they, they ran down a trail together, and uh, Dan had the advantage of a high-tech prosthetic limb, and you would think that Tron's prosthetic limb was something that maybe, I don't know, long John Silver had worn. It was a wooden, I don't think it was a wooden prosthetic, but it was certainly several generations behind Dan's. And at the end of that run that day, Dan said to Tron, if I could just get you back to the States, I would get you a, a prosthetic like mine. Well, six months after the ride, we had a reunion in Washington, D.C. at the wall. And Tron and uh, a number of the other Vietnamese participants were able to come back to the States to participate in that. And when they arrived uh, by air in New York City, Tron was whisked off to, to uh, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, where Dan Jensen is from, and where Dan had arranged for the VA to have him fitted for a new prosthetic limb. There is a, a wonderful documentary that was done of our ride. And at the end of the documentary, it's titled Vietnam, Long Time Coming, and it's accessible on YouTube. At the end of that, uh, of that visit when Tron got his new prosthetic, uh, they committed to run in the next year New York, New York Marathon, and they did that. And uh, in the end of the movie, they're running down a road in rural South Falls, South, Sioux Falls, South Dakota, together, arm in arm. Yeah, beautiful. Wow. <laughs> what a story. And what a way um, just to like, you know, these somewhat small, maybe you could think of them as small acts in the grand scale of things, but they're, they're the stories and they're the acts that make all the difference in the world to these individuals, you mm -hmm. know, and that I relate yeah. to personally hearing it. Um, we're gonna make sure to put a, a link to that YouTube video yeah. Um, yeah. so that people can watch and learn more about that yeah. ride and, that, and hear more of the stories from that ride that, that you were so instrumental Thanks. in organizing. Um, Wow. So, so coming back, I just, I feel, I've, I have these chills that are coming over me listening to you. It's a very emotional um, and um, 
impactful, powerful um, time that you're describing. And mm -hmm. really, I can feel the, um, the integrity with which you, um, you hold these beliefs today, having mm -hmm. lived these transformative experiences with other veterans um, on both sides, like yeah. you say. Yeah. I, I think you're right. I think that, that my, the depth of my feeling and the depth of my commitment is directly related to those, my experiences. And that's why I'm anxious to share it. I think yeah. that uh, uh, without having had the opportunity to have those sorts of connections, I don't think I'd be where I am today, better for better or for worse, uh, with regards to it. And, and I am very proud of the work that I've done with Veterans for Peace. Uh, as you suggested, I have been or illuminated or divulged. I have been arrested several times, and I'm quite proud of all those arrests. I've been arrested in D.C. I've been arrested in Susan Collins' office for her unwillingness to to uh, take a stand against the war in Iraq and shock and awe back in 2003, which we and many, many more people now in retrospect can look back and say it was a gross error and a gross mistake and mm. wrong. I've uh, been arrested uh, at Bath Ironworks, which sort of several times now, three times, and that brings us up to something up to date. But mm -hmm. uh, as I say, in each case, I've been quite satisfied I'm, that I'm doing the correct thing and raising the profile of uh, misdirected foreign policy, if you will. Uh, if there were someone listening who um, holds different beliefs, um, who maybe would like to challenge some of the things that, that you're saying you believe in, would you have any resources or um, in addition to obviously the, the personal experience you've, you've had um, and the, the video that we'll link to about the ride in, in Vietnam. Would there be any um, books or resources or um, um, authors you'd encourage folks to, to be open-minded about reading or considering um, if they wanted to learn more and shift their perspective? Yeah, well, there sure would be. I can probably give you a list today of, of authors that I... Uh, that have been very influential for me. And just off the top of my head, some that, would, that I would include would include Chalmers Johnson, okay. who was the author of uh, his first book of a trilogy was called uh, Blowback. And he basically coined the term to refer to uh, the consequences of our military actions, most specifically our military presence around the planet and how it's been inevitable that there will be consequences for our presence. Mm -hmm. Most particularly would be the fact that we built military bases in Saudi Arabia and Osama bin Laden cited that as one of the three or four reasons that he found it necessary, he and his adherents found it necessary to do what they did and were found responsible for. Um, we have over 800 military bases around the world. I'll, I'll elaborate on that further, but I believe that uh, there's no question in my mind that that presence all around the world and the rest of the countries of the world might have a total of 30 military bases all combined mm. on foreign lands. Mm -hmm. We have over 800. I think that they act as triple wires and contribute to instability around the world rather than making any population ours or theirs safer. Mm. Uh, other other uh, authors that have been so important to me would include a couple of contemporary uh, authors. David Vine is one. He's written a book titled Base Nation. Uh, Andrew Basevich is another. Andrew Basevich was a uh, graduate of West Point, and he lost his son to the war in Iraq. And he's a scholar out of, B I think he's affiliated with BU, Boston University. He's written several books, and I would recommend all of those to... Uh, anyone interested in looking at this perspective of our foreign policy. Wonderful. And, and we'll make sure to put those names and, um, and, right. and links right. in, the, in the comments as well for easy, easy access. Yeah. I see you have something in your hand. Um, what is that? You want to talk about that? <laughs> I very much so. This yeah. is my crypt sheet, basically. I, um, this takes us to Bath Ironworks. I've been engaged in a campaign at Bath Ironworks for uh, I guess at least 10 years or so, maybe longer than that, uh, the Berrigan brothers, who were Catholic priests, Daniel and Philip Berrigan, were very much uh, engaged in the so-called Swords to Plowshares movement back in the 80s and 90s, through which they were advocating that uh, 
that plowshares must be made rather than implements of war. Mm -hmm. And they, part of their campaign took them to Bath Ironworks where they were arrested in the 90s. And in fact, uh, one of them was imprisoned for uh, quite, a, uh, quite a while uh, as a consequence of one of those actions. Um, so ever since that point in time, there has been an anti-military construction protest at nearly, if not every single launching or christening of a warship at mm -hmm. Bath Ironworks. The major uh, military industrial uh, entity or employer is General Dynamics at Bath Ironworks. And we are protesting the fact that they are exclusively making implements of war. Mm -hmm. If you will, things that contribute to the deterioration of the environment, that contribute to climate change, rather than just the opposite, mm -hmm. just stemming the tide of climate change. Uh, initially, the campaign against uh, the manufacture of implements of war was really directed at just the fact that that was, uh, you know, that it was an anti-war perspective. Mm -hmm. We're opposed to war, period. So we're, therefore, we're opposed to the construction of, right. of instruments of war. As we began to look at the overall consequences of these of our war making, uh, we saw that it's really uh, the elephant in the room if you will. Mm -hmm. um, with, with regards to the environmental impact exactly, and yeah. destruction of the environment. So let me, at the risk of forgetting to sure. mention these couple of things, <laughs> I, want to, I want to read you just a couple of things. Please. Uh, first of all, we have uh, a fleet that's equal to the next 13 fleets, 13 largest fleets in the world. So our fleet is larger than the next 13. Mm. We have over 20 times the firepower of any other uh, fleet. Um, the price tag of the Zumwalt destroyer that we were protesting back in April this year, for which we were arrested for obstructing access to that christening on that day of the LBJ, one of the Zumwalt destroyers, is seven million, I'm sorry, seven billion dollars, seven billion dollars to make wow. one of these destroyers. Um, for that, we could make 350,000 homes that could be converted to solar energy. Mm -hmm. So it seems like maybe not a sensible way for us to be going at all. Mm. Uh, General Dynamics has benefited by over 100 and I think nearly 200 million, let me make sure I've got the millions and the billions correctly again, million dollars of state and, and Bath City tax abatements mm -hmm. over the years. And just last year, they received $45 million tax break. Hmm. Uh, so it's, it's outrageous, especially when you consider that the chief executive officer of General Dynamics last year had a compensation package of $22 million. Right. So it just seems crazy that we're making things that are contributing to the deter deterioration of the planet's climate yeah. rather than making other things that could abate uh, yeah. consequences. I, when I think about... Um, Bath Iron Works and the military in general, I think what a huge employer it is for some communities and how that could be a source of resistance to change for a lot of people. The mm -hmm. fear of losing their jobs, the fear of, um, you know, things changing. And um, I, I appreciate the the sort of tandem quality that this, that this pamphlet and what you're talking about addresses, which is um, that it doesn't mean um, the jobs will disappear. It's like we can re reroute this money right. into constructive, um, you know, uh, solar power, for example, other, um, you know, environmentally um, sound uh, resources that we desperately mm -hmm. need and that those jobs, you know, wouldn't have to leave the state or, you right, know, but right. it, it would take a, con, you know, a, an effort and a, you know. Um, yeah, thanks for giving me an opening regarding that. There's a cost of war study being conducted by, by a Brown University in Providence uh, that has disclosed or concluded that um, the manufacture of other things and implements of war would allow for more employment and better compensation than the instruments of war might yeah. enable. So yeah, we're very much thinking that we are allies of the workforce, of the unions at uh, you know, the rank and file, basically. Mm. Uh, what we're struggling with or combating is uh, the power of the military industrial complex, these defense manufacturing companies that are refusing to go, you were alluding to some of the products that they could be making and they would include 
high-speed trains, electric buses, windmills, solar panels, high-tech greenhouses, underwater turbines. Uh, Rob Shetterly, who's a good friend of mine, who's a well-known artist in the, in the state and activist, uh, has uh, suggested that one of the things they could be doing is making ships that might be able to clean up the plastic in the ocean's waters you know, around the planet, the planet's oceans. Uh, which makes all the sense in the world to me. What a better way to be going and what a uh, much uh, more rational sense of or source of, of uh, accomplishment and uh, good works that would mean to the rank and file rather than making warships. Yeah, that's good works. So we think we're allies of yeah. the rank and file. And yeah. we're, we're working to educate uh, the general populace as to that being, we think, a reality, yeah. that's the, like the truth. Um, one of the things I like to talk on this show uh, with guests about is, is life change in general. And it, we sort of already touched on this huge life change of yours, which was from being a participant in the, in the military to being a protester of the military and really advocating for a more peaceful solution, a more a greener solution, just a, a better mm -hmm. use of our resources and our, our lives and our life force energy in the world and, in general. I wonder if, um, if you had anything else you, when you think about life change, because you've been through a lot. You said you had this period of, I don't know if you'd call it stability or um, you know, raising a family, ha having this, um, I don't know if it was a bed and breakfast or some sort of a, a place where you could, you could host people uh, um, um, uh, and then, and then uh, working as a coach even before that. And I know a little bit about your sport um, history that you've also founded this camp, um, whether all of these different chapters or maybe intersecting chapters of your life, um, if, if, if the biggest sort of life change that, that you'd want to talk about was the one we've already touched on, or if there's something in addition that you'd want to share mm -hmm. with, with, with folks, um, just wanted to give you that opportunity. Yeah, it's, uh, during the years of my more of gainful employment. Now, I guess I'd have to be described as being retired now. Uh, when I was, well, I hadn't really become an activist while I was at Dartmouth, but Dartmouth is, I consider, to be something of a conservative institution. My political persuasion would be very difficult, uncomfortable in the Dartmouth community in general, I mm. believe. I have spoken back at Dartmouth on a couple of occasions, and it, my perspectives haven't gone over particularly well. Mm. When I had the camp, uh, there were some issues regarding the Iraq war. I just, the, when I mentioned camp and what uh, Aaron mentioned is in reference to a lacrosse camp that I had for boys ages 10 to 17 uh, for 40 years at the Cardigan Mountain School in Canaan, New Hampshire. And on one occasion in particular, I found myself uh, uh, <laughs> unable to control my politics and suggested to um, all of those in attendance at our closing ceremony that we needed to be more conscious of what the United States was, was doing, what was being done in our name. Yeah. And uh, that didn't go over particularly well. And I know that the clientele at our Pilgrim's Inn would have not, not been particularly impressed by my political perspective. Um, mm -hmm. So there's definitely a challenge in mainstream America. I consider us to be inarguably a very a very militaristic country. Mm. And we've been at war almost nonstop since, since the Vietnam War. And you take a look at that history. One of my gurus is a man by the name of uh, Coleman McCarthy. Coleman McCarthy was a former columnist with the Washington Post and he teaches peace studies courses all over the greater Washington DC area to include at Georgetown and University of Maryland and a number of high schools. Anyway, Colin McCarthy, in one of his quizzes, asked how many of the, at that point in time, this was back in the early 2000s, I think, he said that uh, the United States had dropped bombs on 22 countries around the world since the Vietnam War. Hmm. And he asked how many of those countries did that war uh, conclude in the development of a democratic re uh, country respectful of human rights and the answer is none. Mm. Those warlike endeavors, that war making didn't lead to that anywhere. Mm. So he was just citing the futility of war and how we are, we are, uh, 
we've been miseducated if we believe that this war making is serving anybody mm. other than the military industrial complex. And I strongly believe that. So those are, you know, that's a, a mainstream opinion that, uh, you know, my opinion runs contrary to mainstream opinion. And it's not a comfortable one to be reciting at large. It's, but it's one that we deeply, I think, embrace within the Veterans for Peace community. And, and one that I so appreciate and value, not only um, just to, to expose, if you will, or to broadcast, just so people can hear another perspective, whether or not they're, they're mm -hmm. in a place of being convinced of your views, um, at least there's an opportunity to explore, which I feel like if we're not open to exploration, there's that famous bumper sticker, huh. if you can't change your mind, are you sure you still have one? <laughs> which I love, <laughs> I like that. because it's like, am I even open to asking the question and hearing the answer? I you like know? that, but then again, I I think I, I think I find myself unwilling to change my mind again. I'm not going back. <laughs> right. I've had the one change. That was enough. Well, that's another way of closing ourselves off. But, you know, what, what you're saying about the military and our country, I, I'm seeing this parallel, and it may be a little far-fetched, so stay with me, um, that we're very good here in the West, especially in the United States, with this, um, with our, in, within the, the medical community of intervening, right? If your mm -hmm. um, leg uh, needs amputation, we're great at that. Uh, you know, emergency emergent medical care we're excellent at. The um, overall slow medicine approach that uh, the East has been uh, better at, I think, over the years, um, has, has been infiltrating the West. And we've been like finding, you know, uh, places where we can blend these medicines. But it's, it's sort of this, I think of the militaristic uh, dependence is like, our focus in healthcare on these emergency situations. And if we drop a bomb, maybe that will fix it, right? It's like, uh -huh. I, I don't know if you're following my, yeah, I hope our, yeah. our listeners are, our, our viewers are as well. Whereas there's kind of the slow, less um, exciting approach of actually moving your body every day, eating vegetables. It's like not as exciting as, as, the, as the sort of more drastic interventions that we do when we, when, when we have emergent care, but it's for the long run, sustainable uh, and leads to healthy living. And, and so I don't know if that was too far-fetched. Um, it does sort of provide me with a little bridge into one of my passions. I think I saw this coming. I which is movement. Say, yeah, I... <laughs> and we have you been sitting. Me about this, we have been <laughs> sitting for quite a while. I don't know about you, but I'm feeling it in my legs and my hips. So I'd love to get up and move just a little bit with you, Dud. I promise <laughs> I won't have you doing anything embarrassing. And um, know that you will not be alone because you viewers will be moving right along with us and Dee will probably get up and move too. So what I'll do is, um, for those of you who have not watched the show before, I am a NIA teacher and that means that I teach a movement class that's non-impact and that's good for <coughs> the body, follows the design of the body. So I have Dud here who is going to pick a card with me. Doesn't it feel good to stretch though? It feels Doesn't necessary, it? yeah. It, it mm -hmm. feels necessary, exactly. The body has certain demands and one of the demands of the body is balance. So if we've been sitting, <sighs> standing feels so good. <laughs> so go ahead and pick a card, any card. And we'll see what it says, and we'll see if we've done it on the show before. Oh, excellent. Lateral traveling. Lateral traveling is the card you picked, and I liked it. I like, I like, I like this, uh, this card that you picked. So I'm going to read the description so everyone can stand up wherever you are. And lateral traveling is one of the 52 moves of the NIA technique. And um, 52 moves, some are in the base, some are in the core, some are in the upper extremities. Lateral traveling has to do with our feet, so it's considered a base move. And what we're going to um, do is I'll read the description and we'll do a little bit of lateral traveling and then we'll probably come up with some very profound analogy and weave it back into the content that we've been discussing. Did so I sign a waiver regarding this before <laughs> I came in? I wonder. <laughs> I think you did. That was what you signed when you came in. So begin in a closed stance, which in Nia means that your toes are together and your heels are slightly apart. Yeah, so you form a square base with the edges of your feet. You're going to repeatedly step to one side, practicing these two stepping motions. One, step side, together, step side. And two, step side, step behind, step side. And that one will come to later. But right now, let's just do the side together side. So to the left, it's just lateral travel, step together, step. We'll see if we go off camera and then we'll, we'll come back. I was hoping back. for. 
and then we'll go back the other way, step together, step. And one of the things we do in Nia is we look where we're traveling. So if we're traveling to the left, we look left so that our eyes can tell us and our nervous system can relax because we're looking where we're going. And I'm looking to see if anyone's going to be in my way or if I need to adjust where I'm going. The other variation is step behind step. Yeah, so it's kind of like a different way of traveling. Yep, other foot, step behind and step, pushing into the ball of the foot to step. Yeah, another way of traveling laterally. For both variations, extend your hands and arms in the same direction in which you are moving. When you step behind, step onto the back ball of the foot and keep your knees spring-loaded and your spine vertical. To help get the feel of the motion, imagine you are a dancer and sound the word side. So we're going to do this, keep our hands to the left if we're going left, and we're going to step together, step together, and look where we're going, step together, step together, or step behind, nice. And, <laughs> and we're looking where we're going, and we're having those spring-loaded knees. And you can actually do this even lower if you want more of an athletic experience. Step together. Yeah, and I can tell <laughs> Doug's just trying to get off camera here, but I'm not going to let him. <laughs> I hope that you're moving at home. So unfair. This oh. is so unfair. <laughs> you're doing great. So you can work with various speeds to develop power and agility, and you can alternate sides. You can go faster or slower. D is making some sounds here wondering, what are the benefits? Why are we doing this? What are the benefits of this? Practicing lateral traveling improves your ability to move from left to right in a relaxed way. So often we spend our lives moving forward through space, right? We don't necessarily take time to travel laterally. And that's a change for our brains and for our nervous system. And of course, anytime we cross the midline, we're stimulating our brains in a new way. So that's with our hands and on our feet. Beautiful. Dud, thank you. You survived. <laughs> way to go. Lateral travel. Thank you for picking this card. You feel a little bit like you've circulated something new? I feel like I've embarrassed myself. No, <laughs> no. You know what? No, I, no. That was, that was good. Good. Well, thank you for being game. Thank you for being game and for traveling laterally with me. Sometimes, you know, we want to go forward but the way is blocked. This is where I'm drawing the, uh, the very profound analogy to what we've been talking about. And we have to travel laterally to get around <laughs> the it. obstacle. And that may mean, um, you know, finding a new way forward, right? And um, I'm just thinking about using the resources, the, the suggestion that your friend gave um, Robert Shetterly of using the bath ironworks to create ships that clean uh -huh. the ocean, you know, using existing infrastructure for something that does something that as, you know, how many times more beneficial to all um, on the planet? Mm -hmm. um, that would be a sort of a, 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 a lateral travel into, uh, into a, new, a new way. It's almost like finding a, uh, a parallel, a parallel dimension that we can like use what we have, but create something so much better for everyone involved. I think we need you at our meeting this weekend. Uh, we're having a <laughs> strategy meeting this weekend regarding those of us who are involved in this campaign, this campaign yeah. for climate conversion. I'm going to hold so this a, real steady so that the camera can uh, get a get a look um, on it. And you said that this, this weekend, this, this show might not be aired in time, but are there things uh, later in the year or throughout the year regularly that happen? Yeah, there certainly will be. I don't know when the next christening or launching will be at Bath Ironworks, but we're very much trying to construct our strategy or formalize our strategy going forward. Using this document that I have, um, we, through it, we are petitioning or asking adherents to petition our congressional delegation to sign on to the notion that this should happen, that we should stop building the likes of uh, war-making implements and go on to something different and to the benefit of the, of the climate. Um, so I'm hoping that listeners who might be interested in this at all might go to Veterans for Peace website, that's vfpmaine.org, 
or to, let me read another uh, uh, website, if I may, to uh, globalnet at mindspring.com. Globalnet at mindspring.com would enable we'll you to get links. all the copy that's yeah. on this. Um, so again, we're hoping that people who agree with our philosophy here and agree that this is a good idea might petition uh, Congressman Pingree and Congressman Golden and our two senators, King and, and uh, Collins, and uh, sign on to the petition at, that is requesting them to uh, support the idea that they should be funding different uh, manufactured items at Bath Ironworks rather than warships. Wonderful. And we'll put all those links um, in the comment section Great. under the video and also on my website. Um, Thanks so much. I wonder, in the few minutes that we have before closing, it's been a really fast hour with you, Doug. Um, I'd love to touch on some of the things that you do um, for balance in your own life. Um, it's easy to get wrapped up in, in work or in volunteer activities, I'd imagine, even uh, quote unquote retired, um, it's, it sounds like you're very busy and very engaged. How do you find balance in your own life for your own mental health, for your own physical health, um, emotional health? What does that look like for you? At the, at the risk of my, well, I guess I have to be truthful here because my wife may see this and she would know <laughs> the contrary. I haven't, I haven't found balance quite truthfully, and I am well aware of that. And uh, I'm at risk, my mental health is at risk for not having worked harder at uh, figuring out just what balance looks like in, in retirement. Uh, uh, I appreciate I really, your honesty, yeah. Because I think a lot of people that, relate to that. Um, yeah, the only way I'm clinging to what I consider to be mental health or some facsimile thereof is through my uh, being an adherent of physical fitness. So yeah. that's, um, that's the only way, and I don't think it's sufficient. I think I need to find other endeavors. And what kinds of things do you like to do uh, to, for your body? Uh, these days it's becoming more and more limited, but bicycling, and uh, you can tell, of course, looking at me, pumping, pumping iron yeah. and uh, getting my rowing machine and uh, hiking. Yeah. Uh, that's about it. Yeah, all wonderful activities that I've you I've had to limit all these other things that I used to do yeah. just because I'm making some concessions to the aging process, but, but I'm uh, fighting that tooth and nail. Yeah. Are you still involved with lacrosse at all? Uh, only marginally. That's, okay. I, I go over to visit my friends who are running my camp still today, and I, uh, yeah, really only marginally. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have to say that moving in any way that is new to you, um, new to me, is mm -hmm. great for our brains and our mental health. Um, that's why dancing's so wonderful. So whether you're you a source a of inspiration for me, Aaron, I need I'm a reminder. I better get back to it and increase my commitment to that. You know, it may be something that your wife even enjoys doing a ballroom dance class. Or oh, thanks uh, a lot, Aaron. Thanks a lot. It's not, it's not helpful. Sorry. <laughs> for anyone out watching, we've talked about swing dance and the swing dance community in Portland and in Biddeford. We've talked about Nia a number of times, which is a non-impact way to move your body. There's lots of really fun options for moving in ways that are challenging and fun. It doesn't have to be, um, you don't have to have experience with these things to, to do them, and they can really help um, stimulate our, our, our brains in new ways and keep us mentally young as well as physically. Thanks again um, for the reminder here. Yeah. I, I need to hear that. Any closing thoughts for, um, for the viewership? We've talked about a lot. Um, I just wondered if there's something that you wanted to to reinforce to folks that's close to your heart or something that you haven't had time to say? Yeah, I, I guess I, I would, although it's not that we haven't emphasized this a, a bit already. I would guess that many of Aaron's listeners know of Greta Thunberg. She is the mm. Swedish, the young Swedish woman, girl. She's, uh, and I think she admitted to being a girl. I think she's 17 now. But she has captured the world's imagination, most certainly European uh, uh, engaged citizens in illuminating just how serious this climate crisis is. We can't ignore it. And uh, uh, friends of mine put together, a, uh, I think what turned out to be a very successful convergence, uh, climate change convergence in Blue Hill this past weekend. It was really well attended and we had a number of experts from really around the world speak to the issue. Mm. And it's just a, it's something that all of us who want to see our progeny, our, our uh, 
descendants have a plan on which to live, better wake up and better be marching towards uh, or working towards solutions uh, rather than exacerbating things by the way we live our lives. We need to change our lifestyles. Um, and the more we look at it and the more we listen to the likes of Greta Thunberg, you might want to go to YouTube and YouTube some of her talks. She's yeah. really wonderful. Yeah, we'll put a link to that as well. Great. And, um, and I'm, I'm reminded of the power of language. Um, I sometimes listen to the podcast on being with Krista Tippett and recently got an email about how folks are changing their language around climate change to climate crisis or climate mm -hmm. collapse, um, which is more accurately reflecting the urgency that we need to be thinking and dealing with these matters. Mm -hmm. And um, change just makes it sound like, oh, it's a natural part of change, but it's actually a collapse, a systemic collapse that we're facing. And so I appreciate yeah. you bringing that up as a closing note. And, and you know, um, whether it's making small changes like diminishing plastics in, in your own household, um, not, you know, taking your own fork and knife instead of picking up the plastic ones, um, or mm -hmm. bigger changes like um, changing your transportation, um, yeah. You know, protesting yeah. um, larger issues. I think we all can have an impact at different levels and that we need to encourage each other to do that and to speak our, our voices. So yeah. thank you for coming on and sharing your experience with us, Dud. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erin. I really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning into The Current today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the show as much as I have, and I look forward to seeing you next time. Be well. Bye-bye.